Hello and welcome to another episode of Property Porn Stars, the premium property podcast brought to you by your hosts, David Lindley. And I'm Matt Giggs. And today our guest, our star is none other than Oliver Howard from Oliver Howard Real Estate, OHRE. And Oliver has been doing some pretty big things in the London property market. He's sold over £75 million worth of property in the last two years. He's set some record prices in some of London's postcodes. And on top of that, he's doing some very interesting stuff on social media, which we're going to grill him about today. And if that wasn't enough, if you're listening to this rather than watching it, you're missing out because he's got some of the best hair that I've ever seen in the property industry. <laughs> Number one haircut so he's far. He's got a, a Thor haircut putting Matt and I without, to shame. Without the body that goes with it. It's just we don't know. Haircut. It could be. <laughs> yeah. So stuffed in My wife's not allowed to watch this episode. <laughs> I think she quite likes the long hair. So uh, she's so the style. She's so style. <laughs> So Oliver, welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank no, you. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Absolutely. So talk to us about your uh, journey in property and how you've come to set up your own business, OHRE. What's led you to that point? So, I mean, it all started, people find it quite funny when I tell this story. It all started with my ex-girlfriend in Sweden. Um, this her... is sounding good already. <laughs> <laughs> Just sit back and re- relax. Um, her, her sister's boyfriend was a big... He owned his own estate agency in Sweden. Um, it's a lot more regulated over there. So if you're good over there, you're really good, like you're top of the barrel. Um, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I've just I just finished my degree. I was out working in Sweden for three months. Are you Swedish? Did, no, English. But wow, I've, I thought with the blonde hair and I everything, know, you, me, I get yeah. it all the time as well. Yeah. Um, but my ex girlfriend was Swedish, and my current girlfriend Swedish, so I might as well be there to be perfect. Know honest. what you like? <laughs> absolutely, you know, stick with the type and all that kind of stuff. Um, she'll absolutely hate me for saying that. Yeah, she sees this, but hey, hum. we'll leave that in. Okay? <laughs> we'll leave that one in. She told me off about that recently as well. So hey, hum. Um, but then we went through a breakup, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I know I wanted to be in a big city, so London was where I wanted to go. And I didn't want to do anything with my degree at the time, did a psychology degree, didn't really want to do anything with it. Um, and then I went back to what he was doing and he was making really good money, like driving around in nice cars, nice big house. I was like, well, let's go and see what happens. Let's go try it. So went up to London for a few days at a time, went to interviews and ended up at Marsh and Parsons um, and was there for five and a half years, something like that, moved around offices. Um, started in the Shepherd's Bush one, then Benji, who was my original director at the time, moved me to Fulham um, and basically told me I'd be stupid if I didn't take that office. So I went and took that office um, and then really started the ball rolling. Um, not a lot was happening in Shepherd's Bush at MP at the time, um, but COVID hit when we were there as well and I actually started doing quite well in COVID and they moved me to Fulham and that's where the ball really started rolling. Um, started making some good money started actually really, really enjoying it as well. Not just, okay, we're just putting deals in the pipeline, actually dealing with some really nice houses, really nice people, and in a team where it was really, really competitive, which I think for corporate is what you want, essentially. Um, And then towards the end of my time there, I was doing really well as the number one biller, number one neg. I kind of then just saw something changing in the market a little bit, and thought there was a whole this is where self-employed had just kind of started taking off and people were starting to get big on self-employed and things like this and I was like well it's there to be taken and I want to do something a bit more digitally based um and fair enough to my old company they're a good company but they just weren't very forward thinking um not enough for me anyway I started doing video tours they didn't really like it so fair play I stopped for a little bit and then left just left um and set up my company to try and do something a bit different and actually focus on all of the extra marketing that isn't being done at normal agents because i just thought the same six photos the same this luxury two bed flat in the heart of whatever area just boring nowadays and i wanted to do something a bit more exciting which was actually go heavy on the marketing side and go from there and that's how ohre came about essentially and the business you've set up is are you a one-man band in that business? Do you have a t- team around you to support? What yeah, do the volumes just, look like? It's just me. At how, the long, how, long have you, how long have you been in business as OHRE? Uh, about 13 months. Okay. Something like that. Not particularly long. Yeah. Um, but it's just me at the moment. But I'm quite lucky because I've got a PA coming on in the next three weeks, which is going to be a godsend. Um, and then I've got three or four, uh, two ladies and a guy coming on to start self-employed and have their own company within 
my brand as well. Um, oh, right. wow. So that'll be really exciting when that starts expanding mm -hmm. and I'm not working 19 hours a day and getting yelled at for sitting at my desk all the time, essentially. So yeah, it's we're going to be growing quite quickly this year. Um, but yes, yeah, me at the moment. So come back to that because that's really interesting. Um, I didn't know that. So talk to us about when you left your corporate role, setting up on your own, how did you go about generating your first listings? How do you go about that from a cold start, yeah. especially in a competitive London market and especially in the more premium end of the market yeah. as well? It was, so when I started, I actually took the strategy from my old company, which was when they start opened a new office in a new area, they would say, okay, if you instruct us between this and this date, we'll do it for you for free, um, completely for free. Um, and that's what I did for the first two months of trying to get listings. It was leaflets, cold emails, cold calls saying, look, I've got this experience, but I went out on my own. I'm going to do it for free for you within, if you instruct us within a certain period. Most people did turn around and go, not interested, don't know who you are, never heard of the company, offering 0% is probably not the right thing to do. But then I got my first, first ever listing was a £2 million freehold block with four flats in it. And out of that, I got five instructions because each flat was listed individually. The building was listed. And that gave me then ammo to go to other people. I ammo, ammo is the wrong word, but it gave me something to go to other people and say, exactly, evidence. I am new, but look, I've got a two million pound house on. And that was within three weeks of this campaign. Um, and then the next house came from my socials as well, which was at the start, it was just me talking. It was a load of rubbish, but it was just talking, getting content out there. And it was a three million pound house in Notting Hill. And the guy's girlfriend had seen me on Instagram because I was promoting stuff to the high hills, um, the high hills, sorry. And he, she said to him, get him, get him round, go and have a chat. And that was a 2% listing as my second instruction ever. So it was a 0% marketing campaign to start with that ended pretty quickly afterwards when I actually got other people that were interested in talking yeah. to me. It's an investment, isn't it? The, exactly. um and when you say cold emails, cold calls, mm. and so on, to who? Who have you start on day one? I'm, open I'm, your laptop. Like I'm very, very good. My partner calls me the spy. I'm very good at finding people's details, like really <laughs> easily. So most of what I've done so far is, is a lot of secondhand stock, something that's already on the market. At, yeah, already. Um, and I got that from Ryan Sahan said, if you're starting up your own company or your own brokerage, you need to go after the stuff that is not selling. The stuff that's been on the market for 12, 18 months and take that on because- Prove yourself. Prove yourself, exactly. And it's like, it sounds bad, but if they've been on the market for 18 months, they don't have many expectations in the first place. So you can take the risk. Um, uh, and that's what we did with that. And that's what we did. Sorry, I've completely gone off track from the question. What was the question again? Sorry. It was about how you, it was about the um, generating the first few listings oh, yeah. and then where you get the information exactly. from. Exactly. So I, I would go on Rightmove, go on Zoopla, find a property that was on the market. Like my first uh, flat that wasn't through like socials or Instagram or, or the leaflets um, was on the market for 18 months with, I mean, with my old company. There was a vendetta. I was going after it whether they liked it or not <laughs> anyway. Um, but went on Landreg, found his um, his name and obviously he lived at the address, typed his name in on LinkedIn. He had quite a unique name, found him straight away, messaged him on LinkedIn. Um, he didn't reply. So I did a Google search on him, page four of Google. I found his email and started sending him cold emails. Um, and that's kind of how I did that. Um, and then any phone numbers I can find here or there or people I know that were selling or I've got quite a good memory as well. So anyone that didn't sell when I was at my old company, I knew the address, go on Landreg, find their details and so on and go after that. Um, and that's where most, I'd, I'd say 90% of my business come from is cold emails, cold calls, all that kind of stuff, just being the spy and finding people's information. Which, you know, starting your own business or starting your own business, that's what you got to do. You got to get out there. You, you can't, especially like self-employed stuff, like you can go into a corporate world and you'll get fed yeah, yeah, buyers yeah. and instructions, but going out on your own where I might've had a personal brand in the corporate world, but on my own, with my own company, no one knows who you are at all. Um, and you've got, you can't just sit back and go, don't worry, I'll post a video on socials talking about the property market and think every one of their mums is going to come to you because they just, they don't. I've only, I've now, after 12 months of posting, I've only just started having people come to me through Instagram. Mm. Um, you have to, well, in my world, I, I, I had to go out and get these instructions because no one was coming to me. And if I didn't want to go bankrupt in two months, I had to go out and find these people. So you've done that. You've gone out there and actively canvassed or mm. found details to, to introduce yourself to people. 
but we've just had two guests, both been in the industry for quite some time, who both knew who you were, which is quite nice to Absolutely. know. Absolutely. And that's from the power of social media. Yeah. Was that the centre point of what you wanted to achieve? It was, with, with socials and things like that, that, that was one of the big things I wanted to add to the marketing anyway. And it was, my socials aren't about, let's make me famous. My socials are end game, which is build it now, start getting like videos and views and following and so on. And these buyers that are buying properties now with my four, only 4,000 followers type thing, but hopefully that's 40,000 in five years time type thing. And when they come to sell, they've got that mass of extra buyers or so on looking at it. But it's also the, the socials were such a center point because it's just not being done. It's just not by most agents. And especially in London, there's so, so much generational wealth. It's scary. Like I sold a two and a half million pound house in Fulham to a 19 year old. His dad was buying him and his brother cash properties at two and a half million pound each. And these kind of people are on Instagram. They are, full stop. Whether they're looking specifically for a house to buy or not, you put stuff out in the right way. It'll still come up on their For You page or something like that. And I say to all my vendors, I'm very honest, it's like 95% of the time, you're not going to get anything from socials for your property. But you cannot miss out on that 5% chance where someone sees it and goes, oh, I wasn't looking in this area originally, but it looks quite nice. Let's go and have a look. And that 19-year-old that bought that two and a half million pound house really cemented it for me. It was like, well, we're in London. People spend money on their kids for properties all the time. When I was in Fulham, half of my deals were parents buying for kids. So you've got to advertise out there and get that extra reach, which and me and Tanya were actually just talking about it outside, was on Rightmove, you might get like 4,000 views of a property over the course of two months. On Instagram, you might get 20,000 views over the course of two days. Now, whether all of those people are buyers, absolutely not. They're just like looking at nice properties, but you can't discount those extra people that might not know about the properties or looking on Rightmove in Shepherd's Bush, for example. It's a big factor for the extra marketing. It's just not being done. I think it's just from laziness, but it's not being done. I was, I was going to ask you about that because you said, you said at the start about the additional marketing and the marketing focus that you give properties. Mm. <clears throat> what we, and now we're talking about social media. Is that what is that what the additional marketing is? Or yes is there more and no. As well? It's okay. a part of it. Um, so when I say additional marketing, social media is a huge part of the marketing campaign and it's just pushing it out there type thing. Um, not only helps the vendors, it also brings in buyers and also helps grow the following for the future. But it's also like things like on the portals where you scroll through Rightmood, scroll through Zoopla, everything looks generic. It's all the same. Nothing, unless it's a 10 million pound house in Holland Park, it's all just kind of very similar. Nothing stands out and grabs you. Yeah. Um, so we do everything we can on there as well with like AI generated photos, help from that. Even to things like the summaries, where you see the two line thing on right moving Zoopla when you're scrolling down. We don't do the luxury two bed apartment. We go as clickbaity as, as you can get. Like it works like YouTube, every, all the example. titles. What's clickbait? Like <laughs> it's just really highlighting everything about the flat that's, that people care about. So it's not like the, the long description. It's like massive garden, huge living room, gorgeous bathroom, everything like that. And it's just like lists of things, but it also always starts with video tour mm. at the beginning. And especially in our era, photos aren't enough. A lot of people feel deceived by estate agents' photos. They get into somewhere and go, this look much bigger on the photos. It's so important. And that's why I'm quite proud of this, but every property I've gone up against joint soul, I always sell it. And I think that's because people see the video tour thing, they click on it and they actually get to have an insight of what the property's like. Mm. And it helps the vendors as well, because if you've got video tour on the portals as well, it cuts out all of the rubbish. Like you don't, you're not just doing viewing for the sake of it. People coming around going, I really don't like it. They're seeing the inside of the house before they even go in. And that's why I, do, I think I say to all my vendors, I do like 50% less viewings than most other agents. The video is the first viewing. The video is the first viewing and it gets rid of half of the people. Yeah. Um, so that's, it's like everything we can do to help get in your face and, and really, draw people in it's taking it from more like the youtube and like you don't see a big youtube video with without a clickbait title nowadays it's yeah. like i spent a hundred thousand pounds on this goldfish or something like that it's all stuff that brings you in yeah, yeah, yeah. and for people's biggest investment attention ever attention grabbing isn't it attention grabbing you're selling even if you're selling a 200 grand flat that's so much money you need to do everything you can to sell that flat for 200 grand 
and just doing the standard is, in my opinion, it's not enough anymore. Mm. It's just not. And so talking about videos, because I've I've watched some of your property tours, and that the, even the way the videography is kind of staged looks very different, and the transitions between scenes as well, going through an object or through a plate or a yeah. picture on the wall or yeah. something like that. Yeah, it's um it's different to what's out there. Exactly, and it's like. My partner hates my video tours like that. She doesn't. She much like much prefers the talking tours where it's a lot more calm. But it's it's everything we can do to differentiate that house from other people. And it's more you, right? It's more me. Like I I don't do boring in any way, shape, or form. It's it's high energy. It's like controlled chaos most of the time with me. Um, but it's like it just keeps people engaged. Like my and when I, before I started doing like the heavy transitions, heavy edited stuff my average watch time was about three seconds on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. Since doing all of this stuff and being faster and having the transitions, it's gone up to like 20, 20 seconds, which is still not a lot. Big increase. But it's a average. big increase. Yeah. Um, and I also like pushing the boundaries of it a little bit. Like it gets excessive at points, like my <laughs> 2.75 million pound house, it took me 36 hours to edit it. It was ridiculous. <laughs> and I got no sleep for about four days, but I have to do it so it stands out um, because it all comes back to the marketing. It's like people remember, oh my God, he went through like the fridge door to get into the other room. That's rememberable. Mm. Whereas like the standard 10 minute, like slow horizontal walk through to classical music. Great that people are doing video tours, but you were too slow to that in the first yeah, yeah, place. Yeah, yeah. And now the levels have yeah. been upped again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, catch up. Exactly. But that's, for me, that's the bit that sets my video yeah, aside. I've, I've just hired a young lad, videography. Mm. He's passionate about it. He wants yeah. to learn. He's still very much in the process mm. of learning. Um, he'll be joining me in April. And I've mm. sent him your videos. I'm like, <laughs> look at this guy. I want you to copy him, you know, <laughs> through the fridge. <laughs> You're not listening. <laughs> you know? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, but, but it's, 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 it's but the it's, bit that differentiates it's, it's me. Also, I think, you know, we can't, we wouldn't copy you verbatim because mm. it's your style. Mm. But you get my point. I, w I, want, I want our videos to stand out. So when people watch them, if there's no logo, they know they're they know it's one of yours. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. it's one of those things where it, I'm quite lucky because when I first started doing videos, there wasn't a huge number of well-known creator, like property creators on socials. It's not like America where everyone and their mums is a property creator that's in real estate and they've got thousands of followers, there was only like, you've got Sam Sam from Night Frank, you've got Grant Bates, and you've got Tanya and Toby uh, Toby Albert as well. But they, they're they already very well known for what they do. So in my head, I went, okay, well, I can't copy them, like just doing the normal, like walkthrough tours, Grant Bates is to R&B music, Tanya's is just, just lovely tours type thing. What can I do that separates mine from theirs and tries to build its separate following? Mm. Now, the high editor stuff can go one of two ways. My partner said to me the other day, which really broke my heart a little bit. She was like, I don't really care about the transitions. I was like, okay, well, that's nice. I just spent three hours editing out a <laughs> painting just so I can go through it. And she was like, well, no, it's like, it's one of those things where unless you're into editing or know how much effort it takes to edit these things, it, it doesn't really captivate you like as much as you think it does. Which is why I then started putting the the voiceover to the highly edited tours, yeah. slowing them down a little bit, doing the voiceover, the MS voiceover, I like to call it, like the really deep, sexy kind of voice mm. type of thing. Um, and they now do fantastically. Like my my high edited ones get like I said, three, four thousand views per reel. The voiceover ones that are slowed down, take me ten minutes to do, one of them just hit thirty two thousand views in three days. And it's like, well, it's equal parts it's a great and infuriating the teeth a little it? bit, but you know, it's fantastic at the same time. But yeah. yeah, that's that's what I like to do to try and differentiate myself. And that's pretty much my whole being is how how do I be different to yeah. other people doing the same thing as me? Yeah. And there's so much to be said for that, isn't there? Because like it you know and it's it's an interesting piece of conversation as well, but you're never gonna be liked by hundred percent of no. of your audience. No. So you may as well be memorable and appeal 100%. strongly to the let's just say it's age twenty, I don't know what it is, but Absolutely. the twenty percent of people that do resonate with you and like what you do. Absolutely. The stronger um, you come across in that, the more you stick in them. Absolutely. Out. And I, I mean I I revel people find it hilarious, but I revel in the hate that I get on social media. I find come it on, brilliant. Let's talk about that. Come I find on. it absolutely brilliant because <laughs> Not only did I make a video reacting to all the hate comments I made, I got like nine months ago, <laughs> and that got me 10,000 views on its own, which spurred more hate comments. <laughs> but it's also really clever. If you can embrace that, it helps you Algorithms. massively. 
because Instagram doesn't care about what's being put on your post. Just wants the comments. They just care that there's comments. Yeah. So I said to someone the other day, uh, I think it was when I was Simon Gates' podcast. Um, he was, I listened to that. Yeah. There's a thread on one of my posts of 50 comments now of the same guy just saying horrible things. And every time I say, is there anything else you want to say? Just keep going. This one guy, 50, 50, well, 25 comments him, 25 comments me. But it's fantastic. But I don't mind the hate. I, I think it's hilarious at the same time. I just find it funny people take 30 seconds out of their life to tell me that I look like Boris Johnson, which is most but, of the ones but, that I get. But it helps you. They take 30 <laughs> seconds out of their life to help exactly. you. Because for every, I saw something and I can't remember what this was. I think it was someone, po uh, I think this is on LinkedIn, but I'm sure the same principles mm. apply in some way, shape or form. That one like on a post on LinkedIn gets X number of views. Yeah. One comment gets X number of views. Yeah. So if this person take 30 seconds, put a comment on there, that's X more people that exactly. see your post. Like, thank you, Mick. Keep exactly. it coming. This is and, awesome. And that's where I like to use that. Because for a lot of people, don't get me wrong, if you get hate, on something you actually put some time into, a lot of people would just shut down straight away and go, oh God, that's horrible. I don't know how to do this. And they might then take a break from socials altogether. But if you can get over that and go, all right, cool. Let's have some fun with it. Yeah. I think it humor, helps. Is a, humor is a really good way of handling yeah. it, you know, because you're not only you having fun with it, people watch it. Yeah. Exactly. You know, there's that classic one with the popcorn, people watching. Yeah, 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 the, the, yeah, the yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Michael Jackson. Yeah. And I think it's if you're not generating like, not necessarily generating, but if you're not getting hate over your course of doing social media, you're not doing it right. Miller. Like yeah. you're not doing it. Yeah, you're not. Yeah, you're yeah. not yeah. annoying enough people. Yeah. To you stand want to annoy the other way. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, it, yeah. You, like if you're just uh, horrible thing, but haters feel your growth more than positive people. Yeah. Yeah. Once you get through the window of hate and get more positive comments and hate, then fantastic. Then that's where it grows again. Yeah. yeah. But you've got to just take the hate and yeah. run with it and. Laugh uh, about it. But I agree, it shows you something right. It's, it's not quite the same thing, but I, I went to a, a christening yesterday. I'm a godparent for a child. You're at a christening. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, attractive. Uh, what were you doing? And, the, and the, god, the grandparent of the baby, so my mate's dad, basically, they've got nothing to do with the industry, completely unconnected. Yeah. And I wasn't even aware that we were necessarily connected on LinkedIn, which is where I put most of my stuff yeah, on yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah. He was like talking about that. I'm like, how? Yeah. I was surprised that he even saw it, but I was like, okay, well, this is good. First of all, he's seen it. He's Absolutely. seen enough stuff that he's remembered it, and he wants to talk to me about Absolutely. it. And even if he wants to take the piss a little bit, as you would do in those situations, 100%. you're having a bit, 100%. I don't really care. That's Absolutely. fine. Like, good, okay, it's having that reach that you can't necessarily measure Absolutely. without those conversations. And, and I had something like that recently where I don't really get, like, I've not got enough followers or things like that to get imposter syndrome yet on socials, but I went to a... Um, uh, it's called the buyer the buyer agency. It's like a search agency out in Brighton. I was like, I was the plus one for one of my friends. And I went there and I think 50, 60% of the people knew who I was. Yeah. It felt awful because I didn't know anyone there yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. But it. it's the reach that you get, like even if you're getting three, 400 views per video, the reach you're getting is actually so much bigger than you think it is. Mm, and it is. I made a video about it. It was like, there's more eyes on you at any one time than you think. Yeah. Take that in a positive way or a negative way. But look at it the positive way. If there's that many people that you that you don't know in different parts of the country or the world, knowing who you are, you're doing your job straight away. Like it's it's brilliant. But I think if someone said years ago, full videos and everything else, would you like to have access to ten thousand people yeah. just in a thirty second clip of you? Ooh. What would you do? You know, everyone would have took it. So I think yes. I think people look at it with the wrong lens. They do, and there was there was uh, actually a photo. It's like a, a real estate meme page that's massive over in America. Um, but they actually did a serious post for the first time ever, and it was actually for the social media age now. Four thousand followers isn't a lot, realistically, compared to other people's stuff. If you put four thousand people in a stadium and stand in front of it, it's filled double, triple over. Like it's ridiculous. So it's always trying to find the positives of what it is instead of going, oh God, I've only got 4,000 followers now. Yeah, yeah, for Actually, sure. that is so many people. Like if you met all of them in person, you'd panic. You'd do the opposite. You'd panic yeah. and go, oh, there's a lot of people in front of me right now. What do I do? Yeah. Um, because that's yeah. the fear of video, isn't it? That even if it goes out to a few hundred people, like put, you, put someone on stage in front of a few hundred people. Absolutely. It's terrifying. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's trying to find the positives in that as well. And like... Even even if you're getting a hundred views per video, there's a hundred people potentially seeing that. Like that's it's still a lot of people, and you don't know who those hundred people are. Ninety nine of them could be potential vendors for you. You don't know. Don't Probably know. not the case, but you never know. Yeah. Did you just self teach, self taught, 
the social media stuff or have you kind of gone, do you know what, I need to go and learn or? What socials is one of those ones where uh, I'm, I'm still learning as we go. Like when I first started doing it, I didn't think you'd need like the, the audio, like the trending audios or the captions or all of that kind of stuff. But now like working into it more and more and more, the videos that I've now got that are the highest views are the ones with trending audio on them, the captions on them, how can you clickbait the video? Which is why me and once again, me and Tanya were talking about it outside is on a property tour when we're talking, you see that when you say this is what 750,000 pound can get you in West Kensington, people are hooked already, like they're already there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's self-taught within a And that a increases level. your view time, I suppose, doesn't it? It does. <clears throat> if you increase your view time, you, it's good for the yeah. platform that you're yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. But it was like, the socials is self-taught, all the editing and all that kind of stuff and the, the speaking to the camera and all that kind of stuff. That's it's kind of stuff that I've done for a while. Like I was, a, when I was 13, I tried to be a YouTuber when I was at school and in front of camera, I used to be a DJ, I was a music producer. I'm not scared of getting in front of people and doing that kind of stuff, but the social media is, it's always evolving as well, so it's trying to stay on top of what's going on, but it's all self-taught. And... <clears throat> Do you know, it's a funny thing that, like, usually <laughs> you're saying things and you say, I sound old, and I'm going to say something and I sound old, but, like, there's going to be a generation coming into the industry that are so used mm. to YouTube. content creation. Yeah. Like, that's just come naturally. Like, I remember you talking about it with your daughters as well. They're, they're always... None of them watch the TV. No. no, they're all creating... So that comes naturally to them. So all the stuff yeah. we get hung up about, like, is long gone. They're... Yeah long gone in their minds so i think the next the next generation that come like with real estate and estate agency for example give it another 10 years we'll be where the the states is australia is in terms of everyone is a content creator that, yeah, yeah. that does that yeah. because it's just so ingrained yeah. in like now it's getting so ingrained in what should be done yeah. it will just be a thing which is why i'm quite excited right now because there's not a lot of people doing it yeah but 10 years time that should be what it is yeah. is content creators in property i mean we're not as exciting as america when it comes to like selling sunset you can't have like selling birmingham type thing it's not as exciting but it will get there eventually yeah. but we are like my my 16 year old sister and my 11 year old brother TikTok all day long every day super high energy excited videos and if they want to watch something longer they go on youtube yeah. don't really watch t and netflix obviously but they don't really watch tv no, no, anymore no. <clears throat> um there was a there was a post or something you put out the other day and I wanted to ask you about it and you kind of superseded it here. But you put a post up, you with the headphones on, you're like, oh, 12 hours editing a video. And I thought, what? And then you and they said to them, spent 36 yeah. hours editing a video. And what? Yeah. what? Firstly, like how and, and why? So, mm. and, and, and just put the challenge to this, is that the best use of your time doing that? Can that not be outsourced to someone? Absolutely. It's not the best use of my time. When I spend... I only normally do like over 24 hour editing that takes me that long on my big houses um, because... Okay, you want that to have your personal touch on the video. It's edit. like with my normal properties, it's okay, we're taking it to the extreme anyway and I know that no one's going to compare it. Now with the multi-million pound properties, how do I then take that to a whole nother level and make sure no one in hell could get <coughs> to it? Um, but I do, my editing, I do between like uh, eight o'clock in the evening and normally like midnight one. Um, but no, it's not the best use of my time at all, um, which is why I want to, at some point in the next couple of months, get a videographer on board or someone that I can do the videos and they can edit it for me. But at the moment, I've not managed to find someone that can do it. I'm very, very I'm a control freak when it comes to that. So it needs to be done in my way. Otherwise, it's not good enough. I've not been able to find anyone that can do it in the same way as I can. Um, or has the same ideas like of how to do certain things. Um, but yeah, that, that needs to be outsourced. But at the moment, that's what I have to do to stand out. So it's yes and no, is it worth my time? Yes, it makes me stand out and it brings people to the property and it's exciting. No, could I spend 36 hours better? 100%, especially just on one property. But <laughs> it's, it's what, it what basically helps me stand out. So yeah. if I can get a videographer or an editor on board at some point, then I can spend that extra 36 hours doing something completely different. Um, but this is just me being a control freak and wanting it to be done all my way type thing. Talk to me, I'm, I always like to go into the mentality side of running your own business mm. and stuff like that. I, quite, I think there's a lot of people that fear doing it. Mm. And actually, um, I'm always interested when the guests share a little bit about the ups and the downs. Mm. 
Tell me what in the last 13 months it's been like for you. Very hard. Okay. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's been really hard. Um, I mean, I've already done more business in February than I did in the entire, like money-wise, than I did in the entirety of last year. Um, last year was really, really difficult because not only are you trying to get a brand out there, you're trying to keep yourself sane, not work 24 hours a day, but it's also like, last year was really hard because of all the fall-throughs I had. Yeah. Um, I think, I was trying to work it out before we came on, I think I lost 85,000 pound worth of fees in fall-throughs in the last four months of last year. Wow. Um, which is ridiculous amount of money, it's crazy. Um, but this this line of speaking where people say self-employed is fantastic, go out and earn a ton of money straight away, it's not necessarily true. No. Um, year one, if you can make it through year one, which lucky enough I did, year two is where it actually starts to bounce and things start to happen because you've got more of a brand more people know you, you've got more stats on stuff that you've actually sold, um, but it was hard. I, at the beginning of last year, my anxiety, panic attacks, everything was just always happening because you go through this phase of excitement to start, then uh, uh, what have I done? This is awful, I'm not making a salary, I'm burning money, but now it's starting to come back. But it was, year one was hard. Because like you said, there's a lot of people that thought you can earn 100, 200,000 pounds you know, a year, mm. sounds pretty easy. Type a few things into your yeah. MacBook or whatever, pop a few videos out well, there the, and the you're the laughing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, so, it's, it's so fucking the polar opposite yeah. of that. It's, it's, it's so much more difficult than even I thought it would be. Um, okay, well, tell us that, Can that that's interesting to hear. My, my naivety of coming out of my old company where the last full year I was there, I did 750 grand in billings, I was, doing business every here, there and everywhere, all across West London, not just in Fulham. Um, but I thought, you know what? I can make these contacts work for me. I said, I've got a very good memory. Uh, I freaked someone out two months ago because I went to see the house six years ago. They didn't remember who I was at all, but I went, oh, I know you. How did you ever sell that house in the end? They didn't, and I got a valuation from it. But I thought, do you know what? I'm really good at this. This should be a lot more simple than I thought it would be, but it isn't as simple as you'll ever think it'd be. Because my my naivety went, do you know what I'm doing? I did three quarters of a million pounds in billings in one year. I, if I, even if I do a third of that in my first year, that's 250 grand, let's go rolling in the money. It was nowhere, nowhere near that. Um, but my naivety was, yeah, it'd be easy. It'd be simple. But actually in reality, it was 10 times harder than I thought it would be. Um, but I wouldn't change this year one for the world because it's been a massive learning curve of, certain things that I'm actually very good at. And character certain building. Things, character building. If I can yeah. get over the, the horror, sh not horror show, but the difficulty that was year one, then bring it on from this point onwards. Um, so it, it was hard, but a lot of learning and it was fun as well. Like I got to build my own brand. Like I didn't go and join. I took the risk to not join another brokerage and start on my own. And I didn't even realize how expensive Rightmove was and Zoopla was when I left, but... <laughs> Yeah. I spent so much money there, but it was like, it's exciting to have my own brand out there and not work under someone else and try and build something that actually stands out. And that was like a constant flip flop last year of, oh God, I've made the wrong decision. Oh God, I've made the right decision. Let's keep doing this. But it was year one's hard. It is hard. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's important to get that out there and get that across. What was, um, how do you cope with those full, that level of fall throughs? Because as an agent, in the premium market, hmm. when you when you make the sale, you think oh, that's a good fee. Yeah. The highs are high, and yeah, then exactly. when you lose the sale, you want to hang yourself. That's you, it, know, high, or, you know, it's like in a state God. agency, the highest, the highs are the highest, and the lows are literally the lowest that you can imagine. What's your strategy for coping in those moments? Because we, I don't think there's anybody in the industry who wouldn't share the no. anxiety in some areas of the work that yeah. they do, the struggles that we yeah. all have. Because it is a tough, it's a tough, it's a tough industry. It's an emotional it industry. It is. It's like you, you put so much time and effort into these deals, like just from instructing to then getting through the conveyancing process yeah. just for them to fall through. I've had so much, like over the course of six years, was it a third of properties fall through? You get used to it after a while, but when it's my money and it's a lot more than what it was at my old firm like if i had a million pound property now it'd be a 15 to 20 grand fee for me 
and my old company, it was a thousand, fifteen hundred pounds. And that hurts still, but compared to losing 20 grand, that really hurts. So if I have a fall through, I punch my desk, I go out for a run, and then I come back and get straight on the phones and start calling out. Um, when I first started, I would punch my desk and just leave and wouldn't really be bothered. But yeah, it's happened. These things happen now. Let's get over the pain of that 20 grand was never yours in the yeah, first exactly, place. Yeah. And that's yeah. something my, my partner again, but she told me was the money's not yours until you've completed. Like, yeah, it's so good to have 150 grand in the pipeline, but that's just figures in the air for you right now. When it's completed, champagne out, celebrate, fantastic. But until then, be skeptical of everything that's happening. And now I am. Like, it's, I don't go into it now going, fantastic. We've just agreed a 20 grand fee. Unreal. I'm the best agent in the world. Come on, bring it on. My thing is, okay, we've just agreed a 20 grand fee. What could possibly go wrong? What do I need to get ahead of and sort? And then if it falls through for one of those reasons, I kind of knew it was going to fall through for that reason. But I don't go into it excited anymore. And it's almost bad when we get to exchange now, it's relief as yeah. opposed to excitement. Um, there was I've had one deal in the last 30 months I was excited for and that exchanged last week because the buyers were fantastic throughout, the vendors were brilliant, the flat was spotless. Happy days. Dream. Happy days. Mm. But otherwise it's just relief when we get to that point. I well, can't remember who it was, you might remember, but somebody had like a five minute rule. It was Marie. Mm. She said if anything, like she had some challenges recently and she shared the coping mechanism is, mm. I'll give it five minutes yep. and no more. You know, I'll lose the plot, I'll shout, swear, <laughs> I'd say kick the cat, but I'm a West Ham fan. I'm a West, I'm a, I'm a West yeah, Ham do fan, that. so uh, <laughs> hopefully Kurt Zuma's not listening to this. I was gonna say, but, it comes uh, to the territory, you yeah, 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 apologize yeah, yeah. on that If behalf. you're a cat lover, <laughs> stroke like the cat, <laughs> vigorously. Um, no, nah, look, I think, I think you just got to get your anger out really quickly and don't let yourself stew on it's it. It's natural to be absolutely care about what you're doing mm. and stuff yeah. to go wrong. And most of the time you've put four or five months work into like when you're halfway through like legals. Is you've this, put that where, time this in. is one of the problems with, that I have with social media. And, and perhaps I sometimes think maybe I don't share enough of the, mm. the losses and mm. the failures and the challenges. I'm fairly, I'm very open in conversation about yeah. these things. I don't, as David would allude to. I'm, but you're I'm, right, Chris Walker. Chris Walker said this the other day, because no one posts their losses. But I, no, I, I, yeah. I talk about them. Maybe do I post them or not, not so much? You, it, it's quite funny because actually negativity, if you post about something negative on socials, you'll actually get a much higher reach than you will about positivity because mm. people want okay, to people want to buy into you more than go, oh, well, well done. Like yeah. they want to see well, your human. That's humility, yeah. isn't there? Exactly. And, uh, and that's why like one of my first 10 videos I ever did was talking about when I was at my old company, that over the course of the five years, I lost half a million pounds worth of commission over those five years, six years. And it was awful. And that did like, I had 150 followers at that point and that did like 7,000 views. I think it's really important for the industry as a whole, especially when it comes to self-employed because it, there's so much on the line with these fees that we actually understand each other. Like everyone, we all go through the exact same thing, but no one, as you say, no one talks about it. One, it just bottles up. One of the things that's occurred to me in this particular, it, area of the market where the fees are quite hollow it's a volatile mm. part of the market whereby you know you might see a property come back on the market it's fallen through and it could take you another year to complete on it mm. for argument's sake mm -hmm. and you always wonder whether there's like a withdrawal fee uh, or a, a fee to protect the agent in that area um, and how many agents maybe do that i'd be interested to hear that's what we're trying to i'm actually trying to as a side company at the moment is trying to create, there's already one company that does it, but it's not big at the moment. It like is an insurance policy. Kind of, but it's, it's like a non-refundable deposit, essentially, where actually if the vendor pulls out for any reason, the buyer gets a certain amount of money from it and an agent actually gets their fee cut from that because then it, it helps everyone involved. But it, the whole bit about how, it, it all comes from the property system in the UK and how archaic it is and how broken it is. We can change that life becomes that much easier for literally everyone. Buyers get security, vendors get security, all this kind of stuff. But we're trying to cut, with a non-refundable deposit, it takes two, three weeks to sort most of the time. With what we're doing, we're trying to cut it to two days and get a, a blanket template that gets very quickly altered by solicitors and then it's done. Then I'm more secure in the fee, the vendors are more secure in their buyer and the buyer's more secure in their, their seller. And unless there's anything severely wrong with the property, you are locked in. 
Mm. It's like it's interesting because we were just talking in the last podcast about Gazeal, which is a product for exactly. buyer and seller. Is that the other one you were referring to? Exactly. Yeah, and I think you know that's going to have. It's been around for a little while, and I know mm. that there's quite a few agents use it. And mm. Like I said in the, video, the last podcast, I'm interested. I know in I've spoken to lots of agents who do withdrawal fees. Mm. It's slightly different to that, but just where the vendor takes off the market, especially to contra the upfront marketing cost. So they charge an upfront marketing contribution, mm. so that's dealt with there, mm. or they charge a withdrawal fee. Mm. The challenge with the withdrawal fee, though, is quite often they don't enforce it yeah. because they don't want the bad blood. No, and, and or the vendor will turn around and say, well, actually, instead of the withdrawal fee, I'll instruct you first time next time we come to the market. Oh, okay then. And most agents go, okay, cool, fine. We'll see you in six months. We'll bring it on again and we'll sell it. And it's like, well, no, you've just done four or five months worth of work. To do, to do nothing, essentially, there's a, get there's nothing a, from it. There's a, there is definitely a pandemic of value missing in agents' mm. minds. Maybe it's because they don't believe in what they do. They don't value what they do. But I, I'm getting to the point where I think that's got to change. Like It's okay yeah. us looking after the vendor and the buyer and yeah. whoever pulls that leg. What about the agent? I think the they've problem... They've gone through the... Ringer. They've probably lost a few grand there. I think the problem, you've the, got with, the problem you've got with that is I don't think corporate agents make enough money to care. No. Like if you if you're making say you sell a five hundred grand flat and your agency's fees one percent and you take ten percent of that, yeah. it's not enough money for them to. That's why most corporations go after the big fee stuff because yeah. it's worth their time. Yeah. Um, but I don't think they care enough about it that 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 fee to really go after it in one way or the other. And that's where it differs self employed wise is that's a lot of money for us. Like even if it was five hundred grand one percent, still five grand. That's, really good yeah. and that's why we genuinely care about making sure it happens and then seeing if we can recoup our fee in one way or the other so talk to me you mentioned this at the start <clears throat> talking about the self-employed agents that you're taking on how's that work and and on two counts how does it work one how mm. does it work operationally mm. and what's the setup mm. and then secondly in a personality sense how does it work because you are such a strong character yeah not only that but it's your name above the door yeah and combine those things together, are they going to be yeah, mini you? Well, your, your, to, brand, your brand, your videos are very unique. Yeah. So to combat the my name above the door, I'm actually rebranding in about four to six weeks. Uh, and we've already got the name drawn up and everything like that. But that was also because if I worked under a brand that it was like someone's like Oliver Howard Real Estate, someone comes to work for me, they're not going to want to answer the phone and go, good afternoon, Oliver Howard Real Estate. It's not, it's not broad enough. Like you can't really buy into it. And at the moment, my brand is me. It, it's me. Um, in terms of the people coming on, um, there's one coming from, I'm not going to name any names, there's one coming from another brokerage already, um, who where the commission split is awful, 50-50, and I think as a self-employed broker, you need to be making a hell of a lot more than that. Um, and two are coming from corporate as well, um, because they, they're, they're all very, very good at what they do. I didn't want to take, my first few people I'm taking, I didn't want to take on any newbies or anything like that because I don't have the time to train anyone right now. Um, but I also want people that are going to be able to look after themselves in the industry and actually have this drive to go and make the money and win. Yeah. The company's not really like a, oh, it's fantastic, we're self-employed, we've got loads of downtime, like it's cool. We're... My vision of self-employed is you're there, you come out of corporate for a reason. You're there to actually create something for yourself and make a ton of money in the process um but they're basically going to be coming under as their their own brand their own company but all of the marketing will be under the the umbrella brand um powered by whatever the new version of ohr correct is correct type thing um and but they'll get a, they're getting a 75 25 commission split which i think is much more reasonable um they pay a same as most brokerages it's like a 300 pound uh, a month subscription fee, which is for your marketing, for right move, for Zoop, for all this kind of stuff. Otherwise, I work for them more than they. I, they don't work yeah, for yeah, me. I work yeah, for them. Yeah. I'm there to provide leads to get them started to help them, which is why um, I'm actually someone's coming in to do Shepherd's Bush, which is like one of my main patches because I've built something for them there to carry on with, and then I'm going to go off and do where I used to be, which is in Fulham. I'm going to take Fulham instead. Um, but it's, it's like your own personal brand, all this kind of stuff. But just on the portals, it's under the umbrella brand. But otherwise, goes, go with what you want type thing. Yeah. And how how much are you going to dictate the style? Because you're, I mean, out of the videography and so on, because your style is very unique, it's yeah. very you. Do they have to either find their own style or is it nah, your way? Through the fridge? Whatever style they want. It's their, it's their company. Like, it's their company. It's not like I don't 
my whole marketing thing is I want to be as out there as humanly possible. Like, I just want to be ridiculous. If they don't want to be ridiculous with it, that's fine. But the people I'm taking on, I've made sure that they've either got socials going already at the moment or they are gearing up to do socials mm. because that's the whole brand is the, the digital aspect, the marketing side. So what would you what would you do then if someone came along and they were like super straight lace, suit and tie, you know, maybe you wouldn't take them on in the first place. I'm mm. exaggerating to make a point. Of course. But you've got your style, which is bombastic, mm. which is out there, which yeah, is yeah. attention grabbing. What if they're not that style? Does that... It's... In, initially, I'm not interested. Like, as okay. in the, the first... If, if I bring 10 people on, and that's this year I bring 10 people on, I want future thinking modern people coming on. Yeah. After that, if the brand gets a bit bigger and there's a few people here and there that just aren't interested, they're good estate agents, but they're not interested in that kind of stuff, that's fine. But I'm trying to build a digital based brand and I need people that are also future thinking, digital based, and actually have an, a knowledge and understanding of why it's important for people that want to come in and say, no, I'm not interested in social, I'm not interested in anything, anything like this. They don't understand how important it is. And that's a big block essentially like they could be the best biller ever they could be the best agent in shepherd's bush and make me a load of money but that's not helping the brand um and that's not helping their personal brand either um so initially no thank you yeah but after a while fine so you're doing this what's what what why you why would they want to go with you Mm. because you're still new to this in the self-employed sense I mean, obviously, you're a strikingly good-looking chap. <laughs> I just do the L'Oreal ad. Apart from that. <laughs> yeah, That's but, all you've got, Ollie. That's all yeah, you've got. you got the hair. But, but, you know, what's stopping them just going 100% on their own mm-hmm. versus 75, I think 25? The reality is, is the cost of setting up on your own just full stop is a lot higher than most people think it is. Um, I actually helped someone else, like we worked together a little bit before, but I helped someone else set up their company in Notting Hill, like a super prime kind of thing. Um, And before they started, I actually made sure we ran through all the fees and how much it costs, because I can spend like five, six grand on Rightmove in one month. Yeah. Whereas if someone's going to come on and be under the brand and still make 75, 25, they pay 300 pound a month. And it's uh, terrible at maths, but 3,600 pound a year compared to £3,600 in a month just for for the portals. That's why, and I think even though I'm new, a lot of people buy into my energy and what I want to do. I think people have got a, absolutely, there's a connection there. Exactly, and it's like people are so, a lot of agents are so bored with how boring the industry can be. And there's me running around properties, like two and a half million pound properties in 60, 60, 90 seconds, making myself look like an idiot. But it's fun. It's the energy. It's actually someone that people want to kind of not be like, but like strive to do something like. Mm. And that's why I've, I mean, I've had loads of people asked to come and join me. Um, I've, it's been amazing. And this was even within two months of starting the company and saying I started the company, I had people messaging me. Um, but I think that's why is that I'm still small enough where well, I'm, st- I'm one person, but I'm not like an EXP where there's a million of us and being honest, EXP don't really have that kind of thing in London. They don't. Um, but there's a lot of little individual hybrid agencies in London, but they're all still very corporate hybrid agencies. Whereas with me, it's like, I so couldn't fun, be... Fun's quite a big part of what you do. Absolutely. It? It's yeah, a yeah. fun, excitement, energy. If you're having fun doing it, yeah. actually, you're going to make it more fun for everyone else that's buying and selling. Yeah. And it's the, it's, the stereotype it's, for buying and selling is it's stressful, hectic, and awful. Why? It's because you're just, dealing with um, a boring bloke behind the desk that doesn't really care, isn't really interested. He's got 20 other deals on the go, whereas I now make it fun. And the amount of people that I've had come to viewings that have seen the video tours and go, oh, I really liked your other video as well. Or that one where you did the, the edit through your mouth or something like that. And people find it funny and fun. And I think that's what people like is actually I'm out there not really caring, no red that's tape. That's why I follow you. I, like, yeah. I think it's great stuff to watch. I think it's different. It stands out. Absolutely. They say that the content is supposed to be... Both is preferable, but inform or entertain. Yeah. And if you can get both of those things in one go, Absolutely. you're onto a winner. Absolutely. Like I find myself laughing out loud at some of your content. <laughs> I think it's really good. I can't remember. I was trying to think what it was, and I can't remember what it was. There was something like, almost like a meme that you had interspersed in the middle of a video. Oh, oh it was. Um, uh, <laughs> I did a walkthrough tour of a two-bed flat in Fulham, and 
talking about the privacy of the living room uh, and how private it was uh, and saying you could make an amazing dinner, just sit down on the sofa or you could do something else. And it was Netflix and chill then popped up <laughs> yeah. as the meme in the middle and then it carried on with the video tour afterwards. <laughs> and it's like, well, how do we make, like, that's a bit of fun. Like yeah. people, and it also, because that's 20 seconds into the video, it keeps people that bit more engaged yeah, yeah, afterwards. Yeah. But it's just fun. Yeah. Like it's so boring to you, buy a property. You, 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 you attract fun. those kind of customers as well. I think yes and no. It's a combination. But I, I think a lot of people just like, when I go around to see a homeowner, a lot of people like the energy I bring. It's not just walking around going, yeah, that's nice. Okay, well, how many square foot? Uh, okay, well, it's this much money. It's not, I'm not boring. Like I'm there, I'm excited to be there. I'm happy to be there. Thank you for inviting me into your three and a half million pound house. This is me. I am chaotic, but not at the same time. This is the energy what people want. And with their biggest asset, you don't want someone that's boring and clearly not super interested. You want someone that's, Thank you for this opportunity. This is I love your house. It's brilliant. This is what I want to do to it. This is the viral ideas I've got for it. Let's go to town on it. And uh, like, even if people aren't super energetic and chaotic and like me, that are the homeowners, most of them aren't because they are serious people with a lot of money. Um, they feed off the energy and they really get involved. And the best best example I have of that is um, one of my older properties was a two million pound house. And the guy was an investment banker, she was a surgeon, lovely people, not super energetic, very serious. They'd seen one of my videos and they said, oh, do you know something? There's a balcony out the front of the house. Do you wanna go and stand on it and shout off it for a video? I was like, yes, absolutely, if you want me to. People just feed off the energy and yeah. they like someone that actually is interested in what they're doing, not, yeah, I'm here to pay the bills. Yeah, good stuff. I'll try and sell it. Love that. Brilliant. Well. Oliver, thank you so much for that. You shared so much there. And I, there's been a lot of questions that I've had for you seeing what you've done <laughs> online. And it's working because even just in, in microcosm today, we've had two other um, uh, guests for two podcasts we've recorded mm. before today, both of which knew you before mm. having met you. And that emphasizes and proves yeah. absolutely what you're doing. Absolutely. So thank you for that. We do, however, have a particularly ridiculous closing tradition on the podcast, okay. which is that everyone has a porn star name. You are our premium property podcast <laughs> guest for today, our property porn star. Okay. So and that is comprised of your middle name and your first pet's name. Oh, Please God. have Thor in there somewhere. Uh, Thor is not in there, unfortunately, but that would be a fantastic porno name. Uh, it's not very exciting. Uh, Zachary Crunchy. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty <laughs> good. <laughs> Crunchy. <laughs> Crunchy Zach. It says something about your style, I guess, yeah, if you're crunchy yeah, in, your, in, your, in your name. Yeah, yeah. But... Crunchy Zach, we'll take that. I quite like that. <laughs> yeah. That's up there. That sounds a bit riddled, Crunchy so Zach. Was, what, sort of, what sort of pet was that? A cat? A cat. It had to be a cat. That I turned out being heavily allergic to, but my I'm parents loved him, so I had to get on yeah. with it. <laughs> get on with it. <laughs> I always say I'm, I'm allergic to cats. I grew up with three, you know. Amazing lady. Is that, is that this pent up aggression you were talking about <laughs> kicking them earlier? It's all because it becomes clear now. You made my eyes itch and my nose run. I want to kick yeah, you as far absolutely. as I can. But no, I think the, yeah, the cat, the cat brigade, cats of Instagram, we should make sure that they, oh, uh, God, I know. That they're it's not listening to you. But, um, <laughs> you've been a brilliant guest. What I love is your energy, your enthusiasm and your fun element to selling properties in the uh, London suburbs. And I, okay. I, I think you're going to, people are going to enjoy watching your journey. So follow, follow this man get to uh, connect with him and have some fun watching his videos as well. Fun. Definitely one to watch in every Absolutely. sense of the word. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for listening or watching this episode of Property Porn Stars. We really appreciate it. And we'll catch you in the next episode. See you soon.